questions, please always feel free to question Grant and Jason because they'll come straight to me. So we would love to answer you. Everybody's different, so what protein might work for you may not necessarily work for someone else. Uh, the great thing about the raw purple rice, it is the, it's the world's first on the market. So it's a purple rice, it's high in your anthocyanins, which is an, an, an antioxidant. You've got your pea, you've got your brown rice or, or a white rice that's sprouted, ne not necessarily fermented, but being sprouted, it's, it's more optimal, it's easy to digest, it's more of a form of activation. Uh, th so this one, uh, we've got the vanilla and the acai. So, and then we've got the cacao coconut. Um, the whole raw range is, is a whole complete optimal health, great for your digestion. It's got your added live, your added living raw digestive enzyme in there to help with digestion and it's a full complete protein. Uh, there's the whey range, which is the grass-fed WPI from New Zealand. So it's all premium, certified organic. Um, and there's no, there's no figures, there's no fillers, sweeteners and so forth. Uh, stevia is a sweetener in it, which is a plant. So it's completely plant-based, certified organic, vegan, and biopermate. So it's all sprouted, and then the, the, uh, the pea is fermented, not the brown rice, because you cannot ferment brown rice. Um, they're great for work, like women, children, breastfeeding, and so forth. So they are to everyone's level. We've also got a nutrient range with the greens, the multi, the women's meal, the male and female multi as well, which we just launched. Uh, so feel free to jump onto our website. Smoothie recipes, frozen bananas, almond milk, rice milk, coconut milk, your prebiotic. So being biofermented and sprouted, it's your pre -embed. Your prebiotics are great for digestion. Now, and we'll touch on and go further than that. <laughs> but please, guys, if you have any questions regarding uh, anything, sort of feedback, reflux, or any sort of digestive things, feel free to ask us because we're here to help and everyone's different. So it's a learning world for you as it is for us. We want to meet each and everyone's demand. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Camille. Well, at the end, we'll just all have a bit of a sample. So after and just deliver that nutrition center up. We just head over, we try it, see what we think. All right, take it away, Ange. Oh, great. Can I um, bring this board around, Grant? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, does that mean that I'm not on film? Are you filming this? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where do you want this? <coughs> It's all lined up. Heck up. Mm -hmm. I just see your little head in the corner, eh? <laughs> 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 I thought it was a thumbnail, but it's your head. <laughs> No, I mean like a, a picture of you, but like a thumbnail version of it. <laughs> okay. Cool. Ready to go. Ready did you, to go. Did you need to say anything beforehand? No. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. We've got no. samples at the end anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, Hi team, um, great turnout. So good to see you all training this morning, which is wonderful. Um, hopefully my voice is gonna last. I'm really, really sorry for those that can't hear me that well. I mean, you can please feel free to come closer. <laughs> you guys are really back there, but um, yeah, hopefully it'll last. So let's see how we go. Okay, so week one down, how do we go? Any thoughts? What's your experience like so far? Hating it, loving it. You're very sweet. The recipes are good. Excellent. Okay, that's a good thing. I've got a lot more variety than I'm used to, so Excellent. It's, and I feel like I'm not as hungry as I was before I started. So, Excellent. Yeah, yeah, and eating, I'm eating um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before I was eating like six times a day, but I'm not getting as hungry as I was when I was eating six times a day, so. Very interesting, very interesting. And great, you know, some 
really good things to learn about yourself as you went on because a lot of these sort of things, you know, we hear in terms of what's best to do in terms of fat loss and dieting and all the rest of it and what's going to get us the best result. And, you know, often you'll hear in different circles of people and but a lot of the time um, it, it's all a trend and it's a fad and it's whatever. So, you know, whatever the latest thing that you hear, you'll often take the gospel and say, okay, yeah, you know, I really need to eat six meals a day because that's what's going to help me to get that fat loss at the end of the day. And clearly we can see by practice that that isn't the only way. Um, and that's, I guess, what I really want to talk to you guys about today. And, and this whole nutrition seminar, and um, I know Camille <laughs> did say that I'd be going into a little bit of detail. I, I've done that in the past, um, and, I, and I think that where it gets people is that it's a little bit lost and muddled, and, and I'm the one that went and studied nutrition, so that's all fair and good, and, and science is one part. But I think I need to give you guys a bit of a delivery about how to practically apply it, um, which is the main thing, right? Because that's what you guys are here for. You don't need to know the numbers and necessarily all the science behind it. And whilst everything that I do is evidence-based, um, you guys don't necessarily need to know that. You just need to know that at the end of the day, if what you do works for you and you're getting the result that you want, then you're doing the right thing. Okay. So that's really where I'm going to um, go with, you know, how we're going to structure today's nutrition talk. Um, I really did want to get a bit of a feel for what your experience was like week one. Um, was there anyone that was hungry? Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's good. And we'll talk about hunger as well. Yep, you were as well. Any, uh, anyone experience anything other than that? So I guess, um, you know, maybe digestion. Um, you know, a lot of people said, wow, I went to the toilet a lot. <laughs> you know, I know we don't particularly want to share those sort of moments, but that was one experience that someone had. Um, uh, caffeine detox as well, headaches. Anyone have any headaches? So we've all actually managed to come out of that relatively unscathed. Wonderful. Um, what's the likelihood, guys, that you think you can continue this? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, awesome. And from last, I did the first eight week challenge, and I'm doing it again, and I found it a lot easier the second time, probably because of habits, but also the recipes have hugely helped because it's given us kind of, for me, something kind of exciting to go and try. Awesome. And that's what I want to say. So I will, in a second, guys, go through the meal structure and how I've sort of put that together within your manual. And then I'll, I'll talk to you guys a bit about how I developed the recipes and then added those. And that's actually, as I said, in the first week, um, something that we wanted to do as part of your experience and part of the feedback that we got last time was that the recipes were really needing to, to come through. Um, okay, so... I guess, you know, week one, your experience is down. From here forward, what I want you guys to think about is how to maximise your results, and we'll talk about that as well. So how to really use the meal plan as best as you can to get the results that you want, and that could be very different for many people. So we've got to think about what your goals are as well. Um, the other thing we're going to look at is obviously some a little bit of science behind the principles of body composition and body change, because for a lot of you guys, I know you're after um, a particular result or a particular effort, and we want to know what are the best ways in which science can tell us to do that for you as a physical human being. Um, and then, of course, we'll tap into what is the best diet and, and to really look at um, what the evidence is saying about how to um, best eat, number one, for longevity and health, I think is the most important, um, but also what's the best diet for you as well. Okay, um, so please feel free and comfortable to ask questions throughout, guys, because this is all about you guys. So the more um, questions you have, the better understanding I get for what you guys want to know. Um, the forum has been excellent. I cannot tell you how impressed I am. Number one, with the, the pictures that you guys have been taking of the recipes, absolutely phenomenal. Um, and I think, it, you know, with your permission, I think I might actually use those maybe in a cookbook somewhere later on. Um, because they've been terrific. Uh, the questions as well are really, really good. So these are the things that I wanted you guys to do week one because I wanted you to just really get involved and, and, you know, throw yourself into it and then actually come up with these sort of questions because if you're not doing it practically, um, then you won't actually formulate anything that you really want to know as well from those sort of things. So week one's down. The meal structure. So has anyone brought the, um, the plan with them? So you can, you can pull it out if you like and you can have a look just at the... Um, in the female or the, or the male guide. And what I wanted to do here, guys, was to create a one-page summary, okay? This is pretty much exactly what you'd need as a minimum um, for good health and to support your training and your exercise. So when, I look, when you look at the structure of that, that was only what we had in the first challenge, okay? Um, it looks very boring, I think. It looks very simple, but it needed to be in order for an understanding of you to go, okay, you know what? I can clearly see that I need food groups from here, here, and here. This is how much I need to be eating. 
And then, you know, from that, then you can go and create your recipes. So the idea behind how to use that, a couple of things. You notice that there isn't actually that many breakfast options. And there was an absolute reason as to why I did that. And I know, you know, some of you guys asked for a different option and, and to add eggs and those sorts of things, which obviously the recipes did eventually. Um, there was a reason behind why I didn't put those eggs in there. Um, first and foremost, for the female plan, um, it was calorie matched. So it, it was the minimum that you would pro probably need to eat to support your training and to support good health as well. Um, so the idea behind that was it's, it's just generally giving you a feel of a few different breakfast options. I can't tell you guys how many times I've had clients come back to me and go on, oh my goodness, I've got too many options for breakfast. I actually don't know which one to pick. So I've actually had to eliminate foods from meal plans. So this is where I've come up with the guideline. You get three options. It's enough to know, oh, you know what? I don't have one because I get really restrictive and really bored with one. Um, I've got two, but maybe I might not like the second one. Um, and I've got the third in there just as another backup. So this is the reason behind why, you know, no more than sort of three to four. Um, so that's number one. The other thing is, of course, with eggs, um, they do bump your calories up. So the reason behind why the females didn't have an egg option was purely from a calorie perspective. So um, because I actually gave you eggs in other parts of your meal plan, I didn't want to overload the eggs. Um, once again, it's about that variety. And variety is really, really important. It's, it's what science can tell us is the best thing and the most common thing, possibly with diets that succeed from a long-term perspective. Okay, many, many diets cut out a lot of big food groups and you'll find that those diets are the ones that you cannot absolutely sustain or last. Okay. So the idea behind variety is very important. That's what I wanted to achieve in that. So it's not that eggs aren't in there. It's just that they're just not in for breakfast. Okay. But you can find them in other areas of the meal plan. Um, the next thing then you can look at is the two main meals. So basically lunch and dinner. Um, and these are matched. Okay. So what I wanted to, for you guys to think about is not only how to build those meal co meals correctly in terms of having variety across a broad range of macronutrients. You've got your protein options in there. You've got your carbohydrate options. You've also got your good, good fats, which most people don't necessarily put into meal plans. Um, they kind of just assume you use them, but I really wanted to quantify how much I would like you to have them in there. Um, and then I've given you an amount of vegetables or salad. So interesting fact, I don't know if you guys watched the project, but it wasn't the project. Um, but they've obviously done a, a bit of research. Uh, how many of us actually eat the recommended servings for vegetables and salad? Do we know? 30%? Wow, that's generous. 4% of us actually eat the recommended amount of vegetables and salad a day. That's staggering. Okay, so when we looked at the vegetable content within the meal plan, I was, you know, astounded at, um, you know, how many people aren't actually doing this in the general population. So I've basically given you six cups of vegetables and salad um, in a day. So it was two, oh, sorry, three, two meals. So split over two meals was three cups at lunch and three cups at dinner. Um, and the recommended guide is five to six serves of vegetables and salad a day. And 4% of the population are actually achieving that. So consider you guys as that part of that 4%. That's pretty cool. Okay, not so cool for the rest of the population. So you can see here that there's a massive, um, you know, mismatch with um, what people assume is health um, and what they're actually doing as well and what their idea of what a serve is. Okay, a serve is one cup of salad of some description or it's roughly about half a cup or 75 grams of vegetables cooked. Okay, so that's a minimum. Okay, if we look at, if we look at the studies and the populations that have the least amount of disease, they're eating upwards of eight to nine serves of vegetables and salad a day. Okay, so I'm asking you guys to get in six, and that's a minimum. All right, so that's the structure behind there. So number one, I wanted to quantify, and it should basically formulate half of what your plate looks like if you're looking at it from a physical perspective right in front of you. Um, and if you ever, you know, are doubting that, just take a picture. As I said, I love the pictures that you guys are doing. It, it proves that you're actually getting in, you're practically doing the cooking. Um, but it also gives me an idea of where the balance is coming from for each of those food groups. The other thing I went with is, um, besides being whole foods, is obviously plant-based. And you'll see a big component of that come through. So I've got basically your animal protein, animal-based protein, and then I've got your plant-based proteins. Um, and, I, and I've given you guys the choice between choosing whether or not you wanted to go solely plant-based or, you know, vegetarian or vegan in that instance, um, or if you'd like to incorporate animal-based proteins. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with either. Um, and I think most people say, you know, you're either in one camp or the other. Well, no, it's about variety, right? So I like to have that variety. 
Animal protein is a wonderful source of nutrition. You know, you've got lots of B vitamins in there, zinc, um, and of course protein in the least amount of calories. So from a fat loss and a muscle gain perspective, it's actually a really wonderful food to put into a meal plan if that's the result that you're looking to get. Um, so, you know, as I said, a lot of camps will demonise different food groups and a lot of diets will come out going, don't do sugar, don't do carbohydrate, don't do animal protein. Okay, so for a lot of these things, remember what I said to you guys in the first and foremost instance, it needs to be about variety. So if you like to eat steak, um, if you like to eat eggs, fantastic. Formulate it as part of your meal plan. I've given you the option in which to do so. If you wanted to try something a little bit different and you wanted to go with a plant base, then remember that you still need to get protein. And protein is very important when you're particularly looking at foods that um, will support your muscle as you are in a calorie deficit to lose body fat. And that's important. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail when I explain the principles of body composition. But protein is very important and it was important for your meal plan. So I think a lot of people just go, okay, you know what, I'm going vegetarian, I'm going vegan. And they forget to think, well, where do I get my protein from? And this is a question I get asked many, many times. Um, so the idea behind that was to give you a list of where your plant-based protein options were um, and to choose two of them if you are going to omit a animal-based protein. Okay, did that all make sense to you guys when you read that? Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear, if we have uh, meat, yep. like the one, 100 grams of meat, yep. and whatever the serve is of the, beans or whatever. Yep, the plant-based protein, okay. yep. yep. It's not one or the other. No, it was both. Yep. Yep. No, no, you did it well. You did it well. Yeah, perfectly. So yes, you chose. Basically, I wanted you guys to choose one thing from every single group. Okay, and that's what we said. Make sure all parts are represented. What a wonderful variety. Okay, so for a lot of you guys, you know, the variety increased, which is the best thing that we can do. Um, getting you guys to eat different foods is fantastic. It gives your body access to so many other vitamins and minerals, um, and fiber and you know different sources of protein and those sorts of things as well we have to remember as well guys that um with food we often don't eat things individually so we often combine them in a meal and the idea behind the recipes was then to go okay well how do you take those individual food groups and put them into something that's palatable okay i read something that was absolutely fantastic and they've done research in it funnily enough um, they've actually said that if you don't have pleasure in your food you will be undernourished undernourished from a physical and a psychological point, okay? So if you're not liking what you're eating, obviously it's not gonna feel good. And the other thing from a physiological point of view is that you actually won't absorb as much nutrition from the foods that you're eating. How weird is that? Okay, so there's a lot to be said about variety and pleasure in what you're doing. Um, as we, you know, have all probably experienced somewhere along the line, we've gone on a diet and it's been too restrictive. And at some point it's actually been, you know, after we've all the emotions sort of gone out of the excitement of starting something different and new, um, it's got really boring and it's got really restrictive and you're pretty much hating what you're doing. Has any of us been in that boat? Yeah, I can definitely say that. Um, you know, so this is the big, big thing about finding pleasure in food and in meals and that's exactly what stemmed um, the research into why we're going to do recipes and recipes that actually taste good and I'm so grateful that you guys um, find them tasty as well that was the biggest thing so it offered variety it offered a way in which to create meals but it also um, what I wanted to do was give you guys pleasure in doing what you were doing to make sure that you were enjoying the process was the, end, the end outcome um, okay so as I said Going back to your meal plan, so your meal plan structure represent every single food group. If you're not going to choose to have, um, you know, all of them in that mix, then choose two plant-based options for the protein if you didn't want to have the animal protein. Or if you solely wanted to have an animal-based protein and you know you're going out for a steak that night, you've got a bigger budget in terms of, um, you know, where to get that animal base from in a serving size, then go for two of those options, okay? But protein was very important for us to increase in that meal plan. So, besides breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the other main important thing was to identify your training nutrition, okay? And that's because we want to support what you're doing here in terms of results. So, um, what we know about sports and um, getting the most out of your body and fueling and nourishing with that is um, we need to basically start with some sort of energy in the tank, um, whether that be from the meals previously that you've eaten, say the day before, um, or something that you've immediately eaten. And we can manipulate that to get a performance outcome. 
Um, so for a lot of endurance sports, what we try and do is at certain times to improve their performance is actually, um, I guess, manipulate their carbohydrate to make their body work harder. Um, for you guys, I didn't know when you would train. Some of you train in the morning, in the afternoon, or at midday, um, and possibly all three. So at some point, what I did was just go, you know what, let's separate your training nutrition from your day-to-day -day nutrition. So if you didn't train, okay, and if you know of someone that doesn't train and they say, look, what are you doing from a healthy lifestyle perspective? If they just ate from the meal plan, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they'd be 100% complete, okay, and that's what you should be eating most of the day. So research tells us. Um, and as we can see, you know, with less than 4% of the population, you know, they're not achieving that anyway. So by doing that, they're going to make a difference. With you guys, it's different because you're actually training. So what you're now looking for is a performance outcome and how to best support that. So we know that, yes, having carbohydrate there for high intensity activity is beneficial. Okay, that's a given. Um, during exercise, you don't necessarily need carbohydrate unless you're doing sessions longer than two hours. Okay, um, and, and studies have actually shown us that even a, a simple mouth rinse of carbohydrates, so not even ingesting it, is enough to sort of get your brain going, you know what, I've actually got energy there. So this was guys um, doing endurance-based sports with repeated efforts, um, taking a swig, swig of Gatorade, swishing it around their mouth and spitting it out, and they could continue their prolonged activity. Okay. So a lot of you guys aren't doing sessions that are over two hours at this point in time, so you don't need to eat during the session. So what I've done is I've gone, okay, well, if you've had an overnight fast, you get in there in the morning, you're doing training first thing, let's give you a little bit of a primer. So about 15 grams of carbs, and that is essentially what you find in one serve of fruit. And I've specified exactly what a fruit serve is in those notes. Okay. So that's the reason behind the fruit serves. 15 grams of carbohydrate. Enough to give you a bit of energy, but not enough that I know that you'll be burning more than 15, carbohydrate, 15 grams of carbohydrate in the workout itself. Okay, so you're not falling short. You're just giving your brain something to realise that it's not feeling like crap. Because <laughs> sometimes your brain tells you a little bit more than what your body actually knows. Um, so, you know, it's really psychological when you think about, okay, you know what, I'm going to get a piece of fruit in here and prime myself for activity. You actually train harder. <laughs> Have any of you found that? Were you doing empty before training? Now you've added the fruit, and how was your training? A little bit better. <laughs> you know, even if it's like it was cool. <laughs> um, and then protein, of course. And, and we had Camille here, obviously, talking about the benefits of uh, a product like Raw Amazonia, which, as I said, you know, I don't get paid by these guys, which I do. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, it, it just on paper, it's a really, really good product. And I'll give you a personal note um, I don't drink it because I actually don't like the taste. So here's another reason behind, yes, something's nutritionally fantastic and really, really good, um, but if you can't palate it, then there's no likely that you'll actually keep it up. Okay, so for me, I don't take raw Amazonia um, because I just don't like the taste. And you know what? That's okay. All right? So it's uh, an amazing product, as I said, and its role within your meal plan is to actually support you after training. Um, you don't necessarily need protein powder, absolutely not, but, you know, in the drop down road, I don't know if you guys had a chance to have a look at it, but um, it actually explains to you that we all live in a world that's really, really fast and chaotic, and sometimes convenience wins. Um, so that's the best thing to do. The other thing as well is that it was really, really hard for me to try and boost your meal plan content if you just ate breakfast, lunch, and dinner without adding protein powder in. And the reason behind why I did this, because as I, I'm going on a tangent, but I was trying to tell you guys that when we eat foods, we don't eat them singly, okay? We eat them as combination in terms of a meal. It's really hard to get a really pure base source of protein because most foods will either, like animal, animal meats will contain protein, yes, but they'll also contain fat, okay? If you look at um, legumes, so kidney beans, chickpeas, those sorts of things, they contain protein, but they also contain carbohydrate. So often a lot of foods naturally in nature um, are just one thing besides egg whites. Now we've tampered with it, so it's not the whole egg. So if you remove the yolk from the egg itself, you end up with egg whites, and that is one of the purest forms of protein that you can eat. Um, and the other thing is whey protein. So they discovered when it was a byproduct of making cheese, it was a waste product. Imagine that. And now look at it. It's a billion dollar industry because <laughs> um, they found that it was the best thing, um, possibly funded by the Dairy <laughs> Association. But needless to say, they've looked at research and studies and they found that whey protein is one of the most superior things when it comes to increasing muscle protein synthesis. And the reason why I love it is because it's in purest form. Okay, so it's very simple. And by doing that, because it is 
manufactured, it's less calories. Okay, so that's the other reason why I can put it in there and know that it's not a lot of energy. The other thing to remember about protein is that it actually takes more calories to digest a protein than it does a fat or a carbohydrate. So when you're eating protein, there's a lot of energy that's being burnt just basically breaking that food down so your body can use it. The other thing about protein, uh, you can't store it. Okay, so once it's utilized for the different things that it needs to do in your body, so building blocks for muscles, yes, but not the only thing, hair, nails, you know, lots of other processes within your body. Um, once you've done that, once your body's done that efficiently, it will just need, it needs to deaminate it and get rid, okay? So basically it will go to the liver, um, it'll get cleaved off and then you'll just pee it out. So the idea behind a high protein meal plan is that for the majority of you guys, if you just followed that training, nutrition, breakfast, lunch and dinner, the average female would get around about 80 grams of protein. And if we look at science and they say, you know, what's the, the best or the amount of protein that you need to support training, studies tell us roughly 1.5 to 1.8 grams per kilo body mass. Okay, it's generally if you're training heavily or if you're an elderly population, that's what we would like you to eat, okay, to support muscle mass. Um, for muscle growth and development, obviously you can eat more than that, okay? If we look at 1.8 grams per kilo, if you were, you know, round it up to two, if you're a 60 kilo female, 120 grams is probably what you're aiming for. And as I said, as a baseline, your meal plan was 80 grams, okay? And then we said, okay, well, where's the snacks coming from? So I wanted to create some high protein snacks so you could boost that up for yourself or you, need, or you, don't, or you could choose to have it if you were hungry or not. Okay, and the idea behind protein is that it keeps you fuller for longer. So that's the other thing. Um, it's satiety, it's calorie burning, um, it's supporting your training, okay, from a recovery point of view. So all these beautiful things about protein. Um, but I think when people think, I need to eat lots of protein, they don't have an amount um, in their mind as to how much they do need to eat. Um, so as I said, 80 grams is a minimum. 120 was probably where I'm looking at most of you guys who are training on a regular basis need to go. Um, and how to do that is obviously then by choosing high protein snacks. So what I want you guys to do is have a look at the snacks that I've given you. There's a couple of high protein ones in there. Can we identify which ones are high protein? Would anyone care to take a stab? The hummus, yeah, yeah, that's one. The nut, yeah, the nut butters, yep, and the nuts, yep. The dairy, yeah, absolutely, yep. Excellent, good, wonderful. I don't need to teach you anything. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Entirely up to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And and a wonderful way to go. You know what? How can I incorporate this into making it exciting for me to eat? So I love that you guys are thinking about this because that's what it's all about. So um, sometimes I've had people sort of add them into meals just to, you know, give it a bit of flair and, you know, something different. Um, other people, from a convenience point, they've just grabbed on the go and that sort of thing. So um, for, for you guys, you know, as I said, first and foremost, choose the higher protein if you want to achieve a better result and to get a little bit more protein in your, in your meal plan. Um, and by doing that obviously choosing the dairy foods the nut ones um, and the and the protein powder I've calorie matched all of those roughly because um, what I want you guys to do is obviously choose variety but also to know that if you're going to choose one you can substitute and choose the other one as well and be okay in terms of um, calories so that I don't particularly need you guys to worry too much about it's just from my perspective that's how I structured it um, but yeah, doing things like adding vegetable sticks and stuff like that in, into your whole veggie count, wonderful. And if you want to use that within your snack options, by all means, go for it. Um, people like to use a little bit of protein powder into yogurt to change the flavour a little bit as well. That's absolutely wonderful to do. I've had people use protein powder in peanut butter as well um, and make like a chalk paste. Um, you know, so all these things are, you know, your options are endless. It's just that within that, you want to make sure you look at the amount that you're having and to reduce it by half if you're going to mix them together. Um, or if you want to have that as your total daily intake, that you actually, you're aware of where that nutrition is coming from. Okay, so you plan to do that. Cool. Um, I think that's really all I wanted to try and say about the, the actual meal plan in itself. The other thing to remember with the snacks as well, guys, is obviously there's a massive content in terms of notes on the hunger scale. So that's really where we went back and said, okay, you guys, let's, let's put the ownership back on you guys and let's eat intuitively. 
Um, and so first and foremost, breakfast, lunch and dinner, how do you feel after? Well, there's no need for snacks for some people. Okay, after you did that and you did your training nutrition, then the rest, whatever was left over was like, oh, you know what, I'm, I'm actually quite full. I don't need any extra food. And technically you don't. Um, okay, but if you are to start feeling hungry, and I guarantee that as you go through the process, guys, expect this um, for two reasons. Number one, we, if you are after a fat loss um, result, you do need to feel hungry. Um, fat loss is about um, not giving your body as much calories as it needs in order for it to burn stored body fat. So at some point, being hungry is actually a good sign that you're not over-consuming for what you need. Um, it's a sensation, as I said, that people all too often forget because they kind of just eat just because. Um, and for a lot of people, and because we live in a, a country of an abundance of food, um, you know, wealth and also um, the fact that we can afford and have access to different foods means that we shouldn't go hungry for a lot of people. Um, I guess that's the concept that's out there. Um, but for you guys, as I said, it's about that intuition. It's about listening to yourself and finding out, well, really... Do I need to eat anything more if I'm completely satisfied from the food that I've had because I've built it in the correct way with the right amount of micronutrients and minerals and all the rest of it? Um, by following the meal plan guide, you shouldn't actually need to eat any extra on top of it. Um, so use your hunger scale. Use it within your food diary. There's a column there that you can rate, you know, how do I feel before I eat this meal and how do I feel afterwards? Do I need to adjust that in future? Um, and that is the benefit of the food diary. And, and I know I, I put a post up and say, you know, um, the idea behind why you record is very important and the amount of detail you go into is entirely individual and personal. But I can guarantee you, you won't ever regret putting more detail in there. Um, and at the end of the day, you can look back on the eight-week challenge and go, hey, you know what? Damn, I was doing a good job. That's how I was eating and that's how I felt when I was eating that. Um, and this was my performance or my training outcome. So it's always something that you can use for you guys for your own benefit to go back to. It's a little self-study if you like. Um, and, you know, we all love writing stuff about and discovering things about ourselves. Uh, so it's a really nice little tool to go back to. In any case, if you find, you, you know, you go off track or you do something a little bit different, you come back to those sorts of things. So it's always a good handy tool to have. Um, the idea as well to, is to go another level. So now that you've done week one, what I want you guys to do is go home today and actually analyse yourself and review how your week's gone. Um, I want you to go, you know what, I can do that better next week. Okay, and plan to do those different things the following week because this is all progression. Okay, no, at no point I ever expect anyone to be perfect. It's all about learning what works best for you and how to progress within that as well. So have a look. There's some things that you might want to revise with the meal plan. I always say the best thing to do is to either keep it really accessible, pop it on the fridge so you can go back to those things. So the things that you might go, oh, is that half a cup of oats? Oh, yeah, roughly, oh, that looks about right. No, go back and check. That's what it's there for. Okay, I don't expect you guys to have something memorised. I can't even remember it and I wrote the thing. So sometimes you need to go back and revise exactly what those portions are and to remember those things, that's fine. Do that. It's, it's a showing you guys that what you're doing is you're getting it right for yourself. Um, a few other things as well in terms of... Um, Maximising your results, I've kind of chopped in between, but that's okay, you'll still get the same info. Um, Maximising your results, there was um, a, a reference range. So the things I gave you in terms of how much to eat. So there was a guide between half to three quarters of a cup or a quarter to a half a cup. So maximising your results, guys, as I said, this is the minimum that you should be eating. So if you followed all those lower end guidelines in terms of amounts, um, and you ate off the meal plan, that's the best thing that you can do from a calorie energy point of view to be the lowest in calories, still giving you the amount of nutrition that you need, but also then, you know, harboring your maximum results if fat loss is something that you're after. So if you wanted to push yourself a little bit and challenge yourself a little bit, stick to the lower end. And I'll always suggest that initially anyway, try the lower end. If you find yourself hungry, then boost up your main meals first and then look to your snacks after that. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, awesome. Just go back, remember, and check um, the exact amounts in terms of raw weight, cook weight, those sorts of things, because um, they're really important and they're easy to forget as well. So that's just something that I would always mention. Yeah. No, you're not. You're not. Please, love questions. Yes. Thank you. And that's exactly what I'm going to say in terms of recipe structure. So, okay, so what happens there, guys? So we've, we've sort of put the, um, the guideline structure 
to rest, that's your blueprint. That's something that, yeah, as I said, if you wanted to keep it really simple, maximise results, just follow that to the letter and you should have absolutely no problems. Now, the recipes come in. So the idea behind how I created those recipes, number one, it was calorie match. So you've got the females and the males. Um, and in terms of calories, now this isn't gospel, but this is how I structured them to know in my head what I was doing for you guys. Um, okay, so all the meals are things that I like to eat. Sorry, you've been given what I eat at home. Um, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> So females were 400 as a meal and the males were 500. And you'll probably see that in the nutrient analysis. Not that you really need to focus on that, but just so you know, that's how I built them up. Um, okay, so calorie matched. The first thing I did was go, where am I going to get 20 grams of protein from? Okay. And that was my main priority. And as I said to you guys, it's the main principle behind um, maximising muscle, okay? It's not losing muscle and, and maximising fat loss, okay? So the idea behind that is to go, okay, where do I get 20 grams of protein? 20 grams of protein is also another number that um, consistently comes up in research and in data as being the maximum amount that your body can handle at any one point, okay? So there's a lot of research behind, okay, do we eat a 500 gram steak because the more protein, the better, the more muscle protein synthesis. Well, no. So in, in the end, they actually end up finding that no more than 20 grams of protein per meal is enough for the body to handle and digest at the right times. So the best thing, particularly if you are looking at bodybuilding and those sorts of things, getting a mass amount of calories, the best thing that they discovered to do was to get 20 grams of protein in those small meals every day, okay? Because it gave you an opportunity then to um, break down that protein at a good rate that you could then have another meal. Okay, so that's the reason behind why I looked for 20 grams of protein to build the recipe from. I've used the foods from the meal plan themselves, okay? So if you looked at the total week, um, like the weekly schedule, we've given you a blank one in order for you to sort of work out what your recipes are and to plan ahead in terms of the week and the shopping list and that sort of thing. So that's for you guys to use practically. Um, if you looked at the week structure, you probably wouldn't have noticed, but what I went with was one red meat meal, one chicken, one turkey, two eggs, I think it was, um, a salmon, a high fat fish, a white fish, a low fat fish, um, and then the rest were vegetarian, um, sort of like plant based protein sources. Okay, so the idea behind that is ideally in a perfect world, that would be a wonderful way to eat every single week. <laughs> okay, but we're not all perfect. I don't necessarily eat like that. If I, well, no, some weeks I do cook like that. So let's be, let's be honest. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort to cook like that if you're going to do a different meal for every single lunch, every single breakfast, every single dinner. So what I wanted to give you guys was a week worth of food, seven breakfasts, different, seven lunches, different, seven dinners. But we know that because of your meal plan, your dinners and your lunches are interchangeable. So you could use them for either, really. So I've given you a little bit of a guideline from that perspective as to what the variety I would like to be within your meal plan to look like. Um, you know, as I said, with the animal-based proteins, they're so high in terms of nutrition, nutritional density that you don't need to eat them a lot. In fact, um, some of the research says that uh, eating, I think it was 400 grams of red meat over a month was enough to get the nutrients benefit from it in order to offset the risk of things that are going to lead to bowel cancer. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> That's try, me trying to remember. Um, but yeah, so things like that. And you think about 400 grams of red meat a month, well, that's maybe 100 grams a week. Okay, it's not much. Some people eat 200 grams a day. I was eating 200 grams a day as a bodybuilder. You know, so I was eating up to five eggs in the morning. You know, crazy, crazy stuff. So it's, it's one of those things that at the time, you know, that's what you did to do the outcome that you wanted to do. Um, from a longevity point of view, I can guarantee you right now I'm not eating like that because I just didn't like it, okay? It was expensive too. So the other thing, remember, animal protein is expensive. So we use a little bit of it. And I love Michael Pollan is a, a phenomenal... Um, what is he? He started as a journalist, but he's now basically someone that's revolutionising the food industry in America. Um, but he basically has a few quotes that I absolutely love, and one is, use meat as a seasoning. 
um, which is really ideally how much we want to have of it in those amounts. Okay, really, really small, but because you're eating a beautiful source of it, you don't need to eat much. Okay, so remember that. So that's the idea behind how I structured the week as you saw it. Um, and now going back to the meal, so 400 calories is what I went for. Um, 20 grams of protein was my basically my two stipulations um, and to make it tasty. And the next thing after that was, okay, do I fill it with carbohydrates? Do I fill it with fats? And I've given you a bit of both. Okay, so as I said, not all meals are going to be perfect, um, but I like to eat like that. And it just lended to the fact that the recipe itself went maybe higher fats or it went maybe higher carbohydrate. Um, I didn't really care. As long as it had a good amount of vegetables in it, a good amount of colour, eat the rainbow, okay, lots of vitamins and minerals. Um, the rest I didn't really mind too much about. So if you were to follow the recipes, you would get 400 calories times three, or for the guys, 500 calories times three. So you would get a base of, for a female, 1,200 calories. I don't know if you guys want to know numbers, but I'm going to give you them roughly. Don't focus on it too much. Um, so for the males, it would be a 1,500-calorie meal plan. For the females, it would be a 1,200-calorie meal plan. If you just followed breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we add training. So remember, on the days that you don't train, you don't need your training nutrition. So for a lot of you guys, maybe sometimes that formulates um, a snack, and that might be the case. But on the days that you don't train, you don't have to take your training nutrition. But on a training day, so 1,200 calories was your minimum day-to-day. -day. On a training day, then you'd add probably about 170, 100 for your protein shake, 70 calories for your piece of fruit. Okay, so in general, it's a 1,400 calorie meal plan without snacks, okay, on a training day for a female. That's the minimum I would ever recommend if I'm going to number crunch for a female, a light female to eat, okay? So that gives you an idea. Um, males, of course, we add that, and it's roughly about 1,700 calories, as I said, on a, um, on a training day, okay? And, and that's generally what we find that, you know, you come across meal plans and suggestions and all the rest of it, and... You know, Michelle Bridges, for instance, 1,200 calorie meal plans. That's pretty much all she runs with, time in, time out. Um, but it's how those meals are actually composed. So if you looked at the meals and you created them, were you full from eating them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. No, not really. Okay, so you need all meals. Um, yeah, and as I said, look, this is the blueprint and the minimum. So if you were to eat from the recipes, then, you know, particularly for the guys, if you're training at high level, if you're training more than, you know, once a week, um, for those sort of instances, you're absolutely going to need more meals from that perspective. Um, but as I said, I needed to form a base, uh, a minimum plan, and as I said, dictate, with your hunger, you'll dictate as to how much you eat on top of that, okay? Um, so, this is the guide in terms of if you just ate the recipes, and as I said, some are going to be higher in fat, some are going to be higher in carbohydrates. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, if you just ate from the recipes themselves, they're wonderful in terms of nutrition. They've got the minimum amount of protein in there. You might find that um, you know if you ate a, a higher fat, lower carb meal the night before you did a really hard training session in the morning, it might be a little bit flat. But hey, guess what? As I said to you guys before, I've used that as a training adaptation for some of my athletes when they do endurance runs. I've said, yeah, go on empty. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to get your body to get used to burning fat, okay? And then when we give it carbohydrates, it's going to go, thank you very much. That's fantastic. I can do that a little bit extra. Okay, so there's a reason behind that. It doesn't really bloody matter. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, if you just ate the good, wholesome foods, the fact that you're creating your own meals from scratch is the best thing ever. Um, and there is variety within that as well. So as I said, it's not um, a, you know, exactly perfect from that perspective, but it's pleasurable. It has the right food groups in that instance in terms of protein and vegetables. And the rest, as I said, there's a balance between high, higher carbohydrate and higher fat meals, but that's okay. All right, and I guess, you know, the other thing as well is that I wanted to create some that were easy to do, okay, for those particular moments where you don't have time, you know, that's all you could whip up together. Fantastic. There are some meals that might take you a bit longer, particularly the sushi one. I contemplated putting that in, but I absolutely love that meal so much. Um, and the, the more you do it, the quicker you get at it, but it's a bit of a three-part process in that instance. You know, if you cook your rice first, you've got it there, you got it. it's a bit fiddly trying to roll them, but in the end, the end product is, is really amazing. So I said, it's worth it, I'm going to put them in. Um, and it's something that I really enjoy. So, um, you know, those sorts of things, uh, you know, from that perspective, I just wanted you guys to go, okay, the recipes are there, but I don't, I don't need to eat completely off them exactly. But if you did, you could do that as well. Okay, so does that sort of make sense? Sorry, um, just in regards to the male and female recipes, obviously my wife and I are both doing this, so yeah. if we make one to the male recipe, 
just yeah. smaller portions to do it. Really. Yeah, <laughs> that's. Uh, I did think about that. I did think about that, but in the end, I kind of just went, okay. At least I want maybe. I tried to get them all one serve, but when you're creating a recipe, it's really hard to do like you know an eighth of a bit of time or something or parsley. Um, so that's the reason why, why behind I, I went, you know what, if I'm going to make something you need to make X amount of serves because it's not worth the effort otherwise. Um, so yes, in that scenario, you're probably better off, you're probably, probably better off to follow the female one and then just, actually no, you said you were hungry. Yes. She's just going to eat more. <laughs> um, and that's okay, that's yeah. fine. Maybe you just take a bit off her plate. Um, so yeah, so the idea behind the serves as well, so there's some meals that would be just one serve. The breakfasts are actually really easy to do as a one serve and I've tried to do that. Um, the only trouble you will notice if you actually looked in a little bit of detail, really hard for me to get more than 20 grams of protein in a breakfast um, because, you know, I'm just doing traditional breakfast type of foods, but that's okay. As I said, you'll pick it up somewhere else during the day, so that's not too bad. I'm not, I wasn't too concerned. Um, yeah, so the recipes, some will serve two, some will serve six, whatever. Um, the idea behind that is, of course, then you've got lunch for the next day or dinner for the next day. So, you know, you're not doing a thousand different meals all together all at once. Um, so, yeah, that was the idea behind that. So, Sorry, question. Yeah. Um, with um, some of the recipes, the meat base, yeah. can I, like, um, put in some or something? Yeah, or yeah. Just a you can... You know, what I'd probably do in that instance is have the recipe there but actually build the meal based on the meal plan guide in terms of the amount. So if you did, you know, um, you know, 200 grams of tofu and that, and then you've gone, okay, I'll just use the flavours or the, the, the variety or the spices or the marinade in that and you could pretty much create that meal anyway. Just do it on the serving sizes as per the meal plan. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because I know that was a bit hard, but... I'll, I'll otherwise just don't pick that one but some of the, the um, yeah and this is it so the the um, like the flavor bases could equally be used for a different source of protein absolutely yeah yeah cool okay so is that sort of a, oh, yeah, question? oh yeah um, I, I, I actually I started the revision for this plan for the next challenge and I put that in I literally just put that in um, bone broth yeah, so this is just coming into winter. Yes, and, and the really suit's nice. beautiful, yes. wonderful. Um, so what I love about bone broth, and if you think back, uh, you know, when we used food as medicine back uh, traditionally in different cultures, um, there's a lot of great reasoning behind why we do things like boil up things like um, bones. And uh, the thing behind bone broth in itself is that it's so nutrient dense with how you do it and the process in which how you do it. Um, that it gets the bone marrow from the bones and that's the what we would call traditionally the, the medicine or the thing that we needed to nourish um, whatever it was that you were feeling sick from and particularly you know it's like we have chicken soup when we're sick um, and that's the whole reason behind why we would go with something like bone broth if you can make it yourself absolutely wonderful you know you can do a big pot up um, and, and freeze it and store it because it stores very well and then with that then you can incorporate that into things like your soups um, your stews, even <laughs> slow cooked meals and stuff like that as well. Um, so absolutely fantastic, and that can definitely form um, a substitute for any sort of vegetable stock of any description. Um, stock is wonderful if you can make it yourself. I know it's a bit of a, a, a tedious process for some, so there are obviously um, brands, and that's why I've given you guys some um, food options to look for in the supermarket. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suggest that we all eat um, exactly from the ground. <laughs> um, it's really hard to do that. So where we can get products that um, are going to help and age your lifestyle and are still nutritious, then I'll give you guys a recommendation for that. And that's why I put those little pictures in here and there to show you um, exactly, you know, how I come to make that recipe. And, and it's a bit easier if you can go get the packaged product itself. Um, but yeah, absolutely wonderful to get the bone broth in there. And from a calorie perspective, obviously there's not a lot of calories in it. It might be um, a little bit salty, depending on how you make it. Um, if you're really honing in the fact of using um, sea salt or a rock salt, because it's not only sodium in there, but it's also um, minerals, a lot of minerals that you get from a naturally occurring product. Table salt, unfortunately, is stripped of that, um, and you just get the sodium. But for a lot of you guys, I don't care too much about salt. I know there's a lot of heart health things that say, um, you know, don't have too much salt. Well, that's Plain and simple, you've already eradicated that by stopping eating a lot of packaged foods. Um, so I would suggest add salt into meals because it makes it taste absolutely wonderful um, and it enhances that pleasure as well. So definitely do that. Um, I've actually had uh, some people come to me and say, my GP said I've got low blood pressure, I need to add more salt into my diet. So for a lot of us, we get on the bandwagon of like, oh, let's do something, more is better. Okay, well, let's not have salt. So I'm going to completely eradicate salt out of my diet. Um, and so these ideas, these extremes, it's, it's not necessarily good in a, in a way. Um, we need to take each uh, each sort of, 
I guess, um, claim, nutrition claim out there with, not pun intended, but a great result. Um, <laughs> we just need to go, okay, how does this apply to me and, and where does it fit within my overall aspect of eating? Okay, so yeah, just don't believe everything you read. Um, question, any more for today? That's your question. <laughs> What is so just to clarify, it doesn't, doesn't actually really fit, does it? No, you just add it on top. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Substitute it and set it as a stocking cookie. Um, or if you wanted to, um, things like kombucha as well, you know, these are, you know, um, trendy things now, but as I said, traditionally they've been used for years and years. And, and so there's a lot of beautiful health properties within these sort of um, drinks and broths and things like that. So if you wanted to add that into um, your meal plan, there's negligible calories, really. It's not going to break the budget from that perspective as well. Um, so if you want to add it on top of, great. It's a good source of hydration as well. You know, you think about that. It's a lot of water base. So the more you, the water base um, stuff comes in, the you know, the fuller that you'll be as well. So definitely you can add it in. Go for it. Um, Okay, so maximising your results, uh, you know, I've talked about, you know, the best thing is to keep it really simple, stick to the minimum base meal plan, guide structure first, and then as I said, the recipes, if you wanted to follow that, then follow the recipes, absolutely fine, absolutely fine to interchange it, but as I said, they don't directly match the meal plan itself, because some are going to be higher in protein, sorry, not protein, protein same, some are going to be higher in carbohydrates, some are going to be higher in fat, and that's okay if you're not too fussed about that outcome, but if you really wanting to nail down and do something that's really quite methodical um, and you wanted to get the best result possible, well, yes, choose your higher protein snacks. Only eat to the meal plan itself. Stick to the minimum amounts. Um, really look at your hunger levels and try and hold off where you can. If it's getting to a point where, like I said, on the hunger scale, you're feeling a little bit dizzy and lightheaded, really <laughs> use your snacks then um, for a good reason. Um, and for a lot of you guys, most of the main meals, as I said in the first, um, briefly in the introduction seminar, most of your meals, um, your main meals have enough protein and carbohydrate and energy in them to be a recovery food anyway. So if it means you're timing your training with a meal, if you're training more than once a day, then use that as a recovery. You don't have to eat on top of that. Okay, so I've given you guys basically ways in which to reduce calories. And this is why what's going to lead me into, obviously, the principles of changing body composition. So at any one point, if we want to lose body fat, we need to be in a deficit. Okay, that isn't rocket science. We all know that. The less we eat, the more we lose. Okay, um, for a lot of people, uh, finding a nice balance between supporting your activity and supporting your fat loss goals is really difficult. And this is where a lot of people think, Okay, I'm just going to cut back, cut back, cut back. I've had people come to me on a 1,000 calorie diet, and as I said to you, this 1,400 calories as a training diet is my minimum um, from a numbers perspective and also because I know that it's a right balance. But, you know, people can be eating a 1,000 calories and not balanced whatsoever. Very, I'm, I'm talking extremely high in protein, up to 5 grams of protein per kilo body weight. Um, and, of course, when you do that and you've got a calorie budget, what ends up happening by default is that you eliminate pretty much all your carbohydrates and a lot of fat as well. Um, so not something that's sustainable long term and from a variety point of view completely eradicates everything we're trying to do. So they've come to me with a thousand calories and they've gone, I'm doing six hours of cardio a week and I'm training four times. And I go, right, where do we go from here? I want to lose body fat. So there are a couple of principles and I always re really stipulate this one. Um, it, it doesn't matter if you came into the challenge to obviously lose body fat or gain muscle. What we're looking at here is that from a um, health point of view, we find that the healthiest populations will actually be leaner, okay, so they don't carry a lot of body fat and they will have a higher muscle mass proportion. Um, so, in any instance, when you start eating better, when you start eating for health, by default, you probably end up leaner. Okay, with a higher proportion of muscle. Because you're training, it's more um, likely that you're going to actually be stimulating your muscle for muscle growth if you're eating the right sorts of foods. So there's a couple of things. With principles of body composition change, uh, remembering that nothing ever stays the same. So at one point, your body is in a constant state of turnover. Okay, I'm talking cells, organs, everything, um, and muscle included. So no one at any one point is just coasting. Okay, we're all in a balance like this, okay? And the idea behind it is to create that equilibrium as much as we can. So we're going to go up, we're going to go down, but overall we'll just end up, you know, pretty well maintained. Um, and that's called homeostasis, and that's what the body fights really hard to do. So there's a couple of things. So you can either be um, wanting to 
increase lean muscle mass. Okay. Um, I don't, sorry, I can't really read that. It doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> in which case, if you're trying to increase lean muscle mass, you need an excess of calories. So you need a surplus of calories. So within that, you might possibly put on fat, okay? Because you're eating more than what your body needs in order to stimulate more muscle growth. You also need a training stimulus, which is what you do in the gym. So the principles behind increasing lean muscle mass um, is that you need to eat more and you might possibly put on fat as a result. Um, when you're decreasing fat, um, you're in a calorie deficit. Okay, so essentially we're doing the opposite. Um, you, you are probably not likely to put on muscle. Some people do. Um, not very many people. So, two things. People come to me and say, I want to put on muscle mass. I want to lose body fat. I want to do the two together. I go, right. Following 1,000 calories and you're training 6,000 people. All the rest of it. Um, you need to remember where you came from. So that's basically what I'm trying to say. So at the end of the day, if you want to come in and you want to put on lean muscle mass and you want to drop body fat at the same time, there are only two scenarios where this can actually happen. One is if you've never had a training history prior to doing this. Okay? Never done weights. Might have gone for a walk around the block here or there. Might have done a little bit of sport as a kid. Um, but you've never actually seriously trained weights for a purpose or for a game. Okay? Is anyone in that boat right now before they started the challenge? Think so. Number two, you can do that, increase muscle and lose body fat at the same time if you've never dieted or been in a calorie deficit for a long period of time before. Is anyone else in that boat? Yeah. So plain and simple, for the majority of people, it's impossible to do. Okay, and that's the utter truth. Um, uh, you know, trainers will tell you this. Nutrition coaches will tell you this. Um, if you really actually looked at and understood the science, you can't possibly do it because it's two opposing things. You're trying to say, okay, let's bump up your calories um, and let's put on muscle, but then let's take, take your calories away and lose fat at the same time. It just doesn't work. All right? Is everyone really clear on that? Good. So you either need to be in a state of doing one or the other. Okay? What we're trying to do and maximise within your meal plan is to not lose any muscle, number one, and to be in a deficit to lose body fat. So overall, your appearance will change. You'll probably start to look more muscular, but that's because you're losing body fat off the muscle that you've already got. Okay? Um, for an elderly population as well, it's even great to see that they can do that if they eat the right amount of protein. So we've covered your protein needs, so we don't want to lose any muscle. We've also looked at getting the maximum nutrition out of what you're eating, first and foremost, and then by default, you end up stop eating all the extra crap and all the extra junk that formulated a part of your meal plan before, which by default reduces your calories. Okay, so in the end, you will probably get a desired outcome purely by following the meal plan itself. It's a consequence of following the meal plan. Okay, it's not the main reason as to why you'd be doing it. So does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, very, very difficult and it's a hard concept. And as I said, body composition is, is one of those things that we talk about and nutrition is a massive part of it. Um, but you really need to be really clear about what you're trying to achieve. For a lot of my um, competitive bodybuilders, so these guys do this sort of stuff for a living, um, they put their bodies under this sort of um, strain. We have three cycles, three phases in their contest prep. So when someone comes to me and says, I want to do a competition, I go, great, are we a year out from starting? Because that's what it's going to take to get you on stage in the best possible condition in the healthiest way possible. By no means, that sport is not healthy. Absolutely not, we understand that, but most elite sport isn't, okay, it's extreme. So from that perspective, we do a three-phase cycle. We actually go, you know what, okay, we're one year out from competition for this three-month phase, or for this one-third of the cycle, um, we're going to increase your lean muscle mass, and we're going to focus on doing that. So we're going to give you good food, good calories, so you can grow from that, but it's more than what your body needs. Okay, and yes, you will put fat on. If it's one for one, that's great. One kilo muscle, one kilo fat by the end of that phase. That's actually excellent. If anyone's tried to put on muscle before, getting a kilo of muscle in three months, next to near impossible. Um, for females, I like to think, you know, over a year, maybe 500 grams would be fantastic. Um, by the same token, then we look at fat loss and the rate of fat loss. So after we do the build phase, we move to the next phase. And that's where we go, you know what, let's try and hold on to what we've got and not put body fat on. So then there's a maintenance phase. And a lot of people think, well, why? You're not doing anything if you're not losing fat, okay? Actually maintaining your current body composition is really, really hard to do. And it's a great goal in itself. 
So a lot of people forget that, that if you are just to maintain your weight, that's bloody hard, and that's wonderful that you're doing that. Um, so, you know, the next phase, we look at maintaining what we've achieved. Yes, if we get a bigger strength gain, great, but we're not trying to give them more calories, so we hold off the calories, we relax a little bit on the calories, um, and we just say, look, let's just be a little bit more mindful that we don't want to put on too much body fat. And then in the last phase, if we've done all that correctly and they didn't start at a point where they were severely overweight, um, then we take the next sort of 16 to 18 weeks um, at fat loss and progressive fat loss. So you guys are doing an eight-week challenge. I start these guys after six months of monitoring everything um, in a fat loss phase for 18 weeks before they get to stage. Okay, 18 weeks of calorie control, specific meal planning. So with what you guys are trying to do, just be realistic. Please be realistic. So when we look at fat loss, all I'm trying to do there to achieve is actually around two, maybe 300 grams of fat loss a week. Most people will tell you you can lose a kilo a week, right? Do we expect that? Okay, because that's what we've been told. They're absolutely ridiculous. Some people, obviously, if you're obese and you've got lots of fat to lose, which none of you guys are in this room, um, then you could possibly do that, and that would be a rate that would be very realistic for you to lose because you've got a lot to lose. Okay, at any one point, even those guys, though, slow down. So when you look at the science behind someone saying, okay, well, you can lose a kilo of fat a week. Well, one kilo is 7,000 calories. Okay, 7,000 calories from an energy point of view. You divide it by seven days of the week, you need to be in a deficit of 1,000 calories a day. If you're eating 1,400 calories and I say to you, you need to lose a kilo of fat a week, I'm going to take 1,000 calories out. Impossible. Okay, and that also goes to show as well, there was a biggest loser. Remember there was a, a series where they had to eat like the contestants and they went and they ate and then they, they put on six kilos. I think Michelle put on six kilos or something in that week. And she was like, look at what I've put on, six kilos of fat. It was literally impossible for her to put that on. My dietitian friends and I did the numbers, because we do. Um, and we sort of looked at what she would be needing to eat in surplus or in excess of that. So remember I said 7,000 calories is one kilo of body fat, times that by seven if she put on seven kilos. And that would mean that she'd need to eat this plus an extra 2,000 calories a day. In those programs, there was a picture of her vomiting. She wasn't actually eating all that. So it was near, next to near impossible for her to put on that amount of body fat in that amount of week. Okay, so you've got to remember it's a lot of fluid weight as well, but it's also food volume and all the rest of it. But what I'm saying then, I'm returning it back to the fat loss concept, is that there is science and there is, you know, you can be in this amount of deficit for this amount of weeks and you're going to lose this amount at the end of the day. Well, guess what? You're not a robot. Everyone's different. Everyone responds differently. So that's the other thing to remember. And as I said to you, there's that pleasure in eating as to how much you absorb in terms of nutrients. If your body is so fantastic and so ingenious to know how to do that, you can guarantee at some point if you put it into a starvation state, you are a human, you're going to try and survive and your body's going to try and fight it. So with these people that get to a point where they're like, I'm still eating zero and I'm still ex you know, expending X amount of energy, um, but my body stopped burning fat. Well, yeah, it's pretty much shut down. Okay, it's, you know, it's revolting against what you're doing and it's not going to end well. And that is as far from health as you can possibly be. So just be realistic. So we're talking about two to 300 grams of fat loss a week is enough so that you can still eat and currently still do what you are going to do, but not be so deprived that you're going to binge or blow out somewhere else or go and have your cheat meals. Really, really terrible concept. Unfortunately for a lot of people, the idea is that you can cut everything out the whole week and then on the weekends you can have your free weekends. Well, I've seen this blow out some people astronomically in, the, in order to, you know, in order to, um, you know, save themselves mentally from the restriction that they've, they've had all week. So a really, really terrible concept, and unfortunately it sets up um, a lot of disordered eating patterns that we have to reverse in time. Um, it also mucks around with your metabolism. So remember, I said to you, metabolism, your body is something that wants to survive. If you're going to put it in a calorie deficit, you are literally starving yourself. That's what it is. Um, you know, fat loss is about starvation, but good fat loss. Um, clever fat loss is about finding that small amount of deficit, enough for you to continue what you're doing in terms of a meal plan, but still keeping your body in check and saying, you know what, I've got enough nourishment so I know I'm not starving. Okay, and that's really hard to do. So that's hopefully with the plan that we've created, the best possible scenario if you get that, okay? But at the end of the day, as I said, be realistic, be achievable, uh, achievable about your time frame and how much fat you want to lose within that period of time. So if we maintain muscle and loss between two to 300 grams of fat loss a week over the entire course of the eight-week challenge, that is an absolutely sensational result, okay? And the other thing to remember, it's not about just the numbers. So 
It's the journey, it's the process, it's all the behaviours that you now are implementing that you're going to then continue with. The other thing to remember, if you can't sustain something right now, there's no way in which you're going to... Re there's no way in which you're going to keep your results. Plain and simple. So if you can't do it now, um, and you can't do it, then you can't do it beyond eight weeks, and then of course you can't maintain the results that it took, or the effort that it took to get you to that point. Okay, so we need to strike that balance. And as I said, we need to make it pleasurable. Um, you know, the best diets out there, yes. What do we believe that the best diet is? Well, they've done lots and lots of studies because it's such a, a highly committed topic. It's something that people love talking about. There's a different diet on today, tonight. There's a different book released. You know, there's a multitude of things out there. And it's a $600 million industry, okay, of which I'm not getting paid one cent because I know and I can live with myself and sleep at night because I know that every single one of those are all fads, okay? They're either eliminating one food group or another and they're not something sustainable that you can actually maintain long term. Okay, so just remember that. At the end of the day, if you can't sustain it, no diet, no matter how good it looks on paper, is ever going to be worth it. You need flexibility and you need to be committed to it. All right? So that's the idea behind the best diet. And with a lot of these sorts of researchers, there was common factors that sort of came up. So they did a massive meta-analysis probably about two years ago. And they looked at all the diets and said, okay, well, which one is it? Is it the 2-5? Is it the gluten-free? Is it the Mediterranean? Is it the paleo? You know, they looked at all this sort of stuff. And they looked at, from a long-term point of view, what people got at the end of it and how people maintain those results long-term. And at the end, most people, I think it was about 92 to 97%, regained what they lost over the course of following that challenge with that diet okay so big big rates there um, if something that you can see yourself doing now means that you can do it in future as i said there's longevity in that and that's what we want you might not do it exactly like that you'll adapt it to how you like to eat but that's the main thing so plant-based was the biggest one i'm gonna wrap it up guys no no you're right all good all good see you guys um, so plant-based was the biggest one so the more fruit and vegetable everyone ate the better we know that now we know clearly we're not getting enough um, most of the population um, the other thing was to have actually grains came out so eating grains was better in terms of reducing risk of chronic disease um, which is interesting because a lot of these um, grain-free diets go on the presumption that it's anti-inflammatory which isn't the case um, and the other one was drink other beverages other than soft drink. So they didn't, even, they didn't even say anything like reduce your alcohol. That wasn't even in the picture. Um, so, see me. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, these are the three principles, the three main principles that they discovered out of looking and analysing every single one of these diets that actually guaranteed scientific, you know, evidence based that we can say that will absolutely hands down improve your health from a longevity point of view. Um, so, all of the things there obviously is included into your meal plan as well. Um, so that's what I wanted to hone in on, guys, and, and I guess, you know, give you a bit of a, a background and a science behind why we built those meal plans, the reason behind them, but also to look at it not just from a numbers perspective but a bit more of a global approach and to say, well, yeah, what we're doing is actually going to benefit us from a long-term point of view. We are going to get results from it, but you actually need to enjoy what you're doing at the end of the day as well. Okay. So hopefully you've got a bit more, um, you know, reason behind why we're doing what we're doing for the next seven weeks as i said keep your food diaries up analyze them at the end of the week um you know pop your questions on the forum i'll be doing your end seminar as well so we want to revisit those those goals originally that you guys wrote down um, and we'll have a look at where to from here because really you know after you finish the challenge we need to have somewhere to go after that too so i'll focus back in um and see you guys at the end of the process and is there any other questions or anything else that we cover yeah um, you give some realistic like for instance, if you have a function yeah. or a meal with friends instead of just going there and drinking water, and I know people like to just make the salads and things like that, but you know, like. I'm going to give you, that is so good, I'm so glad you brought that up, that's one thing I actually forgot to mention. Um, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to give you the best advice ever. And you can talk to the other guys that did the previous challenge. Um, the best thing to do in that situation, go and enjoy yourself. Don't even think about it. Eat whatever you want and enjoy it. <laughs> Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's one meal. If you eat, you know, three, well, five, let's say if you have two snacks of training food, five meals a day, seven days a week, 35 meals, one meal out of 35, it's going to make a difference. And you know what? It'll set you up mentally to go, you know what? I feel really good and I take pleasure in enjoying doing this. And it'll reinstate the whole rest of the week just to get you, 
you know, motivated to then prepare things ahead of time as well, because we know that takes effort. So yeah, absolutely. If you've got a social function, please do keep it to the social functions. Don't just create social functions. <laughs> um, if there's you know, a particular event or something you're looking forward to, um, yeah, absolutely. Put it in your diary and go and absolutely have a ball. Have a few drinks for me. Um, I'm breastfeeding, so I can't do that right now. But um, it's all, you know, it's all positive. So that's, the, you know, as I said, it's about longevity, it's about flexibility, uh, it's about enjoying yourself too. So that's the flip side to what we're doing. We all going to go out for a social meal now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for your attention. You've been awesome. And I didn't lose my voice. <laughs> And I didn't even look at the clock, sorry, I've probably gone way over time too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, Anne, should you have a, a link or would you know the name of that um, study we've given them? Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yep, I've got it um, directly in a presentation I did for corporates. Oh, yeah. oh I think you might too. Do you want me to just do it on, on Facebook? Yeah. Whatever works. That's easy. Yeah. 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 It appeals to my nerdy side. Yeah, it's, it was freaking awesome. Like, yeah. And I did, um, it was. Uh, two o'clock in the corporation blows my mind um, in the city and I just and it was basically all their um, team leaders and I just gave a talk on every one of the diets and yeah. then in the end I actually pulled up this meta analysis and said yeah you know we can do this we can do that but yeah. at the end of the day that's exactly what they pulled out of all the research yeah. after analysing everything and yeah. isn't it wonderful to know that it's just about moderation it's just about the yeah. balance and you know it's not sexy to say that though that's yeah. why we're that's not right. making the millions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It has to be something oh, um, yeah. marketable. Yeah, yeah, marketable, something different, and it needs to have a beautiful face attached to it. <laughs> you know, that's the other thing. So, celebrity chefs, well, all the rest of it. Face. <laughs> They're getting there. <laughs> but yes, I'll send that to you, no worries. Yeah, that would be good. Thank you. That was really informative. Oh, sometimes I don't know what I ended up talking about. I have all these notes, and then I just go off and so much knowledge in there. Oh, it all comes too much. In a yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Yeah. 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 Stop this yet? No.